Why hello there and welcome back to some more psychology revision as we decide to tackle aggression. Very aggressive, aggressive stance there. Rawr. Rawr. Okay, okay, right, let's go. Let's begin uh, with Sarah Coleman. Hello. 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 Beginning hello. with the role of genes and XYY syndrome where, in essence, men have an extra Y sex chromosome. Do they? It is the Y chromosome that causes an embryo to become male, and since males are considered more aggressive than females, having an extra one may suggest more aggression. An example uh, where this has been found uh, is among inmates of institutions where approximately 3% were found to have XYY syndrome, where which compared to 1.1% of the normal population is significant. Yes, yes it is, yes. Now further studies indicated that these men were taller and higher testosterone and lower intelligence than non-XYY people. Yes, on to the AO2. AO. However, some researchers um, challenged the relationship between aggression and XYY. A large-scale study found no link between aggression and the syndrome. They did, however, find support for previous, from previous findings that XYY had lower levels of intelligence. They were more likely to commit crimes, but it was found that these were not violent. Um, essentially, criminal records were found that they just weren't very good at being criminals. Suggesting that they aren't more aggressive, just that their lower IQs made them more likely to be caught. Hence the increase of percentage in prisons. Yes. Now, you could also say that the research is gender biased as it's only conducted on males, so it's androcentric. Aggression in females may be expressed differently. Evidence showing females are more likely to, uh, to be indirect, the, specific, blah, blah, the scientific term being bitching. Ooh. A little bit cheeky, cheeky there, cheeky. That's right, cat fight. Genes AO1, uh, another AO1 if you want another one because the it's a big SAO. M-A-O-A gene. Yes, not to be confused with MAWAMs. Very important. Mom. Now, although no individual gene for aggression has been identified in humans, a gene responsible for producing a protein called monoamine oxidase A <laughs> or MAOA has been associated with aggressive behaviour. MAOA regulates the metabolism of serotonin in the brain and low levels of serotonin are associated with impulse, impulsive and aggressive behaviour. The study of one Dutch family found this in its male members, really, as they behaved in a particularly aggressive way, including rape and arson. That's quite aggressive. It was found that they had abnormally low levels of MAOA in their bodies. It was found that the, de uh, the defective gene was passed on to uh, problem men for the X chromosome from their mothers. Yes. So, different forms of the MAOA gene have actually been identified. One is low activity, MAOA-L, which produces less of the enzyme, and the other one is high activity, MAOA-H, which produces more of the enzyme. Research has suggested that the, this is that it is the low activity gene that pre predisposes an individual to aggressive behaviour. It's all true. AO2 for this supporting evidence comes from studies of twins living together. Quick recap. MZ twins share 100% of their genes, whereas DZ twins share only 50%, but both are in the same environment. Yes. Now, therefore, if MZ twins are more similar than DZ twins, evidence for genetic influence is found. One study found that uh, concordance rates for aggressiveness were... Where 72% for the MZ twins and 42% for the DZ twins. It is all true. Um, as MZ uh, were higher, this suggests the role of genes. Now, further evidence has been found for MZ twins were who were weir weird. Weird. <laughs> weird. Weird. They're really weird. Reared apart, who were found to be still highly similar in aggression with 64% concordance rates for MZ twins. However, findings from... Uh, twin studies have been extremely variable. One study finding a concordance rate of only 14% for MZ twins. But whilst the numbers vary, the great uh, similarity of aggressiveness between MZ twins is consistent, suggesting, suggesting that there is at least some role of genetics. It is possible that the variance is due to methods of assessing aggressive behaviour in different studies. Research showed that rates varied when self-report was used, 39% compared to when reported by others, 53%. There are other problems with twin studies, and it is likely that MZ are more concordant because they are treated more similarly as they look the same. Findings um, may be because of more similar nature rather than nurture. Yes. No, sorry, nurture rather than nature. What are you doing? What are you doing, Sarah? Oh. And finally, MZ concordance is never 100%, which, if it was purely genetic, it would be, theoretically. Further support comes from um, adoption studies. 
If uh, adopted children are more similar to their birth parents than adopted, it suggests that genes are more important than environment. One study in Denmark uh, of over 14,000 adoptions found that a significant number of adopted boys with criminal convictions had biological parents, particularly fathers, with criminal convictions, providing evidence for the role of genes. However, it is reductionist to argue that genes are the only cause of aggression. It is. Genetic explanations focus only on the role of nature, ignoring the role of nurture, for example, upbringing. Recent research suggests that both nature and nurture interact to cause aggression. In one longitudinal study of over 1,000 children followed over 25 years, it was found that males had been severely maltreated as boys were more likely to engage in antisocial behaviour, including violence, as adults. However, males with the MAOA-L gene were... L. See what I did there? Sound effect. Carry on. Cool. Were uh, two times more likely to be diagnosed with an adolescent, um, with in adolescence, with a conduct disorder compared to those with the M A O A dash H gene. H. I love it. I love it. <laughs> right. They were three times more likely to have been convicted of violent crime by 26 years of age. The results indicate the importance of an interaction between the genes and environment influence. Neither having the MAOA-L gene nor the experience of maltreatment alone predicted later aggressive behaviour, but having both of them did. Research reporting the role of genes in determining aggression is socially sensitive as it brings up many ethical issues for society. If people are predisposed to be more uh, predisposed, predisposed <laughs> to be more aggressive or more criminal by their genetics, then questions surrounding genetic engineering and selection of offspring follow. Should- should unborn children be tested for aggression? I don't know. If so, they are found to be. If so, and they are found to be aggressive, uh, should the parents opt to not have the child? I'm guessing that that question was rhetorical from you. Yes, yeah. rhetorical. Yeah. Right. There are also implications for criminal behaviour, as if a person has inherited an aggressive predisposition, should they be held responsible for their crimes? In 2007. Um, a man admitted to stabbing and killing a man and received a sentence for over nine years. However, in an appeal court, judge in Italy cut... Uh, sorry, I was... OK. Should we, should we try that again? However, an appeal in court... Uh, an appeal court okay, judge... OK, I'll, I'll try the third yeah, attempt. How, really however, an appeal court judge in Italy cut the sentence by a year <laughs> after finding that he had gene variants linked to aggression. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> uh, neural mechanisms, A01. Yes. On to neural mechanisms and to research, which is focused on two brain structures important in aggression, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. There is one amygdala on, amygdala on each side of the human brain found within the temporal lobes. Yes. They are part of the limbic system and are known to be involved with emotions. The prefrontal cortex is sh- located, shock horror, in the frontal lobes of the brain. It is though thought to be involved in planning and moderating our behaviour. The prefrontal cortex is directly connected to the limbic system and it is thought to regulate the amygdala-driven emotion respo- emotional responses, exercising some sort of emotional control. The theory is that aggression is dependent on the interaction of these areas in the brain. The amygdala has a role in producing aggression and the prefrontal cortex acts as a mediator, taking the amygdala's impulses and deciding whether or not to act on them. And it is argued that damage on these to these brain structures causes difference is in aggression. On to the 802. We love it. We love the AOT. Yeah. Yeah, we do. It's good. good Come on points. in. Come on in. Evidence supporting uh, the role of the amygdala has been obtained from animal studies. Rabbit animals are violently aggressive and it's known that a virus that damages the temporal lobe can cause rabies. Also, sustained electrical stimulation of the amygdala in laboratory animals usually results in fear and rage responses. Such research on animals allows the IV to be manipulated in a way that is not possible on humans, so cause and effects can be assumed. However, human aggression may be more complex than that of animals. It is likely that there are additional factors that influence humans, so it may not be possible to generalise to... yeah generalised to humans, although similar results have been found in humans. In humans, there is supporting evidence from psychosurgery. One study reported that 43 out of 51 patients who received operations to destroy their amygdala showed more uh, normal social behaviour behavior afterwards, including reduced aggression. And also, it's been found that patients with temporal lobe epilepsy can become more aggressive to people close by, even attacking furniture. What? This supports the view that temporal lobe is I- involved in aggression. Really. More direct evidence comes from finding that humans who have their amygdala electrically stimulated show a, range, uh, show a rage response. Another example is the case of Charles Whitman, who killed 14 people and wounded 32 others during a shooting rampage around Texas University's campus in 1966. <laughs> the shame. He the was, shame. 
he was shot and killed at the scene, and an autopsy revealed he had a tumour pressing on his amygdala. Although we do not need to be careful in generalising one's in... One, we do need to be do, careful. We do, sorry. It's very important. misread that. We do need to be careful in generalising one individual's case. It does seem to suggest the amygdala's role. Now... Further evidence comes from neuroimaging studies. One study investigated the brain activity of 41 murderers versus a control group using PET scans. PET scans are used to assess the brain activity by measuring the glucose uptake in brain cells. Yes. Now, the more glucose they take up or metabolise, key word right there, key word, mm-hmm, key that's, word. Right. that's right, the more activity they are. The there researchers are. found reduced glucose metabolism in the prefrontal cortex in murderers' brains, suggesting reduced functioning in the prefrontal cortex. In, in, in the murder. So suggestive. There is also a lot of supporting evidence that damage to the prefrontal cortex results in a range of responses associated with aggressive acts, including loss of control, impulsivity and immaturity. One study showed that the damage of the prefrontal cortex in infancy is particularly significant in later aggression. Yes, and the researchers compared adult patients with adult onset damage with those with infancy damage, i.e. before 16 months. Both groups showed increased aggression and antisocial behaviour, but the infancy onset group showed more extreme antisocial behaviour and they scored poorly on tests on moral and social reasoning, performing at a 10-year-old level. This suggests that early onset patients had damaged their prefrontal cortex at a crucial time, disrupting the normal development of social and moral behaviour, increasing the risk of behaviour in adulthood. The adult onset patients had only received a damage after moral reasoning had developed, therefore damage was less serious. It is true. It is argued that research into neural mechanisms raises socially sensitive implications. If violent criminals had faulty brain circuitry that affects their moral reasoning, then should they be held responsible for their criminal behaviour? However, we must be aware of the limitations of the research. It is reductionist as it reduces aggression down to the functioning of the brain structure. Therefore, it focuses exclusively on the role of nature, ignoring the role of nature. In reality, the environment is likely to be uh, very important too. Zimbardo argues that when trying to explain the horrors of Abu Ghraib, we need to look at the situational factors, i.e. the de-individuation of prisoners and guards and the lack of supervision of the soldiers rather than the biological factors. It is likely that uh, to be aggressive, we need both biological predisposition and and an environmental trigger. And don't worry, we'll go over Abu Ghraib in the last video in this series. Yay. On to Hormones 801, Animal Studies. Animal studies, we love them. Yes. Now, the main hormone thought to be involved in aggression is testosterone, which we will just call T, or this will take twice as long. T is the main um, male... um, Sex hormone. Sex hormone. And belongs to the glass class. (laughs) And belongs to the class of hormones called androgens. God, that was your one. There are numerous research animal studies indicating a link between aggression and tea. One example involved castrating male mice and they found that aggression reduced. They d- demonstrated the importance of tea later by injecting the mice with tea and they found that aggression was re-established. Though the mice may have been ticked off that you chopped off their ghoulies and poked them with a needle. Yes, that may, that may have been why they were a bit cross. On to the AO2. Now, in fact, later research revealed that high T is necessary but not sufficient to trigger aggression. In an experiment, in an experiment, male mice were rated as aggressive or non-aggressive, then castrated. Bit harsh. Then, when given T replacement therapy, only the mice initially rated as aggressive showed rest- restoration of aggressive behaviour. Therefore, T is necessary for aggressive mice to exhibit aggression, but injection injecting is not sufficient enough to turn a pacifist mouse into an aggressive one. Furthermore, castration only reduces aggression if done before puberty. It seems that T contributes to the development of aggression, and once it is accomplished this, it affects um, its effects become relatively permanent and largely unaffected by subsequent loss of testosterone. Tis all true. Now, animal research, as we said earlier, is good as we can manipulate the IV and infer cause and effect, but they may not be generalisable to humans as humans. There is a larger role of cognitive processes, and we're not mice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, AO1 for human studies. Oh, you want to do human studies? I was just doing animal studies. It's such a coincidence. In which, for ethical reasons, testosterone cannot be given to people to see if aggression changes. Instead, researchers must investigate T levels in people displaying aggression. One study investigated the relationship between T, um, crime and prison behaviour. They did? He measured T in the saliva of 692 adult males adult male prisoners um, found that those who committed crimes involving sex and violence had higher T than inmates who had committed burglary and theft. Also, high T males also violated more prison rules involving confrontation. Now, on to the AO2 for human studies. 
That study, though, uh, yeah, let's just go on to the AOT. Now, that study can be criticised for only looking at criminals. However, the researchers also found similar behaviours in college students. They measured the two levels of 240 members of uh, 12 uh, fraternities in two US universities. They found that members of fraternities with the highest T were described as boisterous and macho. A bit like <laughs> uh, someone we know, eh? Ma- Connor. Whereas those in the lowest T fraternities were attentive and helpful. Mm-hmm. However, the research is correlational and therefore it is a problem with, but there is a problem with bidirectional ambiguity. Now, it could be that aggression causes T to increase and there is some evidence for this actually. Now, research really? has shown that during status conflicts, T rises in the winners and declines in the losers. Therefore, T not only affects behaviour but also responds to it. Now, some criticise the research for being gender biased as it studies basically males in really mainly yeah Mm -hmm. that was a word very well and therefore show androcentric bias though whilst women have less testosterone it affects its effects are considered to be the same researchers measured the levels of t in 84 male female sorry female prison prison inmates female said male too many times female prison inmates and found uh, T levels were related to criminal violence, although this relationship was not straightforward. T was highest in cases of unprovoked violence, but lowest where violence was defensive, like abused wives who retaliated. Research into hormonal influences on aggression raises socially sensitive implications. Why? If violent criminals have faulty biology, it is it uh, that increases their aggression. Then, should they really be held responsible for their behaviour? Again, you and your rhetorical questions are outrageous. Mm. Further research, is, uh, f- further research raises implications for treatment, like chemical castration. That's no. We should be aware of the limitations of the research and its <coughs> tentative nature before we start changing the legal system. Da, da, da. And research is reductionist as it reduces aggression to levels of testosterone. Therefore, it focuses on the role of nature, nature. ignoring the role of nature. Nature. Where in reality, em- environmental factors are clearly important Very too. Very important. For example, Zimbardo argues that when trying to explain the horrors of Abu Ghraib, which we'll come on to in the last video, we need to look at situational factors. The de-individuation of the prisoners and guards, um, the lack of supervi- supervision of the soldiers rather than just the biological factors. It is likely that to be aggressive we need a biological predisposition and an environmental trigger. And finally, new evidence shows that tea encourages fair behaviour. In a study, participants were either injected with tea or a placebo. They played a game in which they could make fairer unfair offers and they found that the tea, the tea participants with testosterone actually made fairer offers than the placebo groups. Oh, there we go. So it's exactly the opposite to what Sarah said. Now, those (laughs) who had made the most unfair offers were those given the placebo, but told that they were in the testosterone group, suggesting that participants used tea as an excuse for being unfair. Therefore, the researchers concluded that it is a myth surrounding tea, not tea itself, that causes aggression. And that's it for this part, part A, all biological. Join us next time as we tackle adaptive we're all very excited about that yes we yes, are yes we are yes we are yes, thank we you are. for listening any Thanks. questions ask in the comments any lovely lovely little messages please do say it. i read everyone and i love them and any complaints they make me cry no they don't yes they do haters gonna hate yes they do <laughs> bye bye